Monko friend. Yes. yes. Monko. Yes. Um, I'm just trying to remember who succeeded Bill Barr. Anyway, I've got to start. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, we've got a session here on the case for trade, or the, perhaps more rightly nowadays it should be called the case of trade, um, since we're living in a rather different era from the one of, let's say, 1994, after the Uruguayan were completed till the, until the financial crisis. Um, I've been following trade very closely since the 1970s um, when I worked on it at the World Bank. So this is a case, something very much close to my heart. I even wrote a book in favor of globalization, last living human being, I think, who <laughs> falls into that category. Um, anyway, uh, so there are some very, very big issues going on in this area. And I think we're got, going to have a very exciting discussion of it, of it at least I hope so. Um, obviously, there have been concerns about rising protectionism um, and um, uh, including um, populist uh, um, reactions to what's been happening in trade. Um, this has occurred in many, many countries, but including um, systemically immensely important ones like the US. Um, there's been concern about what's happening at the WTO and its effectiveness as an institution. Uh, um, there are absolutely central issues, perhaps the most important dimension, or one of the most important dimensions of the relationship between China and the West, and China and the US in particular, but China and the West. And uh, so the future of the world order in, in relationship to tr trade is clearly a fundamental issue. More recently, we've had COVID, which has raised profound questions about supply chains, supply chain vulnerabilities, raised the, the notion of sh friend shoring uh, and other issues. And uh, most recently of all, um, and as you can see this in US and Europe, um, in many different ways, a sort of genuine revival of industrial policy ideas and and the idea of subsidies to promote industrial change and protect industries from disaster. And that's clearly going on in both the US and Europe. Uh, and we've heard that, for instance, uh, Ursula van der Leyen said implies that. So this is a, so a really big question is, what is the future of world trade and the future of uh, uh, this? And in the background, we're going to have other discussions. There's obviously very important issues now about the role of labor and the impact of trade on labor. And we've had those discussions here before. So I think this is a really important subject. Um, and I have a really fascinating, wonderful panel. Uh, so I'll just introduce you very briefly. To my left is Catherine Tai, as I'm sure you all must know, uh, is United States trade representative and therefore is the representative of the US truly in trade negotiations. And uh, that goes, I think, back to the Kennedy round. That's, I that's think right. so. Um, so with very distinguished predecessors, as we were discussing. Yes. Um, and, uh, and Catherine has obviously come to this position at an absolutely pivotal time for the, her country and the world. Next to her is An Duk Gyun, Minister of Trade for the Republic of Korea. I actually first visited Korea in 1972 in a World Bank um, mission and became absolutely overwhelmingly impressed with the country's trade performance, which has been spectacular over all those years. To his left is David Schwimmer, who's Chief Executive Officer of the London Stock Exchange. And to his left is Veronica Nilsson, who's Acting General Secretary of the Trade Union Advisory Committee to the OECD. Um, who is from Sweden, uh, which might in this case turn out to be very important. So let's start off with you, Catherine. Each person here will have four minutes to, up to four minutes, not longer, to discuss the, the main issues. So if you just sort of lay out what is the US trying to achieve in world trade and how does this fit in with the Biden agenda? What, is, what are the key points of your agenda? 
Wonderful. Thank you, Martin. It's wonderful to be here uh, with you, uh, with my distinguished uh, friends and fellow panelists, uh, and with uh, all of you. This is my first trip to Davos. I've understood it's pronounced Davos. Um, and uh, um, I've heard so much about um, this, and I'm delighted that uh, both with uh, uh, pandemic management and recovery, uh, and with the, uh, um, all of the technologies that we have today uh, that uh, we are able to uh, convene. Um, let me take up your question, which is, what is it that we're trying to do in trade? Yep. Um, well, first is uh, we're absolutely committed to supporting trade and economic activity. We are committed to uh, creating uh, opportunity, in fact, um, we would like to take the focus hitherto um, of the um, uh, global economic order and the, um, the world trading system as it is, simply to um, increase prosperity, to take that to the next level and to take think about um, what other purposes uh, that prosperity uh, is serving. Not prosperity for prosperity's sake, prosperity for uh, the uh, opportunity for people to pursue uh, their ambitions, to realize their potential, to provide for their children. Um, in short, uh, to make the world a better place, to make living a better experience. And so um, what we talk about in terms of President Biden's instruction to me uh, is um, the creation of uh, a trade policy that is worker-centered. So let me take a little bit of time to talk about this because this is really is central to um, the uh, guiding spirit of um, uh, how we are conducting our trade policy, how we are engaging with our partners and our friends, how we are trying to create that economic opportunity. Um, I think that uh, the World Economic Forum is an institution that is associated with a very um, a specific kind of globalization. And I want to take a pause here and talk about the fact that uh, there has always been some version of globalization for as long as human beings have been interacting with each other and have established economies. This particular version of globalization, though, I think is in the process of evolving. There is a world economic order <clears throat> that um, is, uh, is, is changing. And I, I just want to point out that um, uh, in this era of this version of globalization, there has been a tremendous amount of prosperity that's been produced. Uh, if you look at um, uh, the statistics and the GDP numbers and spend some time on the World Bank uh, website, you will see these increasing numbers worldwide, uh, incredible growth in certain parts of the world especially. It is really inspiring. On the other hand, I think that uh, you made reference to um, populist reactions to this version of globalization. I think the lesson that uh, we are taking is that uh, this version of globalization um, is uh, running into some limitations. Enormous amounts of prosperity <clears throat> without um, uh, an inclusiveness that comes with it. Um, rising inequality. Uh, in many different economies is driving um, a desire on our part uh, to lead the conversation and to lead the thinking around what a new version of globalization might be, what a new economic world order might look like that builds on what we've just experienced, but more importantly, learns lessons. And I think that one of the most important lessons is let us not in this version of globalization, lose sight of who we want to benefit from our vision and from the economic opportunity that we want to create. And that is, let us not lose sight of the people, the people that comprise all of our economies, who are not just consumers, but who are also workers, who are also uh, family members, community members, let's look at the quality of the prosperity that we are creating and uh, ensure that we can uh, further development uh, in a positive way. 
So um, I'm delighted to take part in this panel um, and take the opportunity to explain to this very important audience how we are looking at the world, <coughs> how we are looking at um, trade, and how we are trying to learn lessons from a number of very painful years uh, that I think have caused all of us in um, uh, leadership positions, whether it's in the business world, in government, in civil society, to uh, really press ourselves to think about uh, how can we do better, how can we learn lessons. Okay, we'll come back to the details implication, but that's a very good statement of the philosophy. Thank you. So, Minister Ahn, yeah. what is Korea's approach? And do you go along with this idea that the, the old model didn't work very well for the people who mattered? Uh, is that the same sense in Korea? Or do you, did you actually rather like the old model? Well, um, because of uh, pandemic and uh, the military risk in Russia, in o other places, um, and uh, many other uh, the diplomatic uh, risk, we are encountering huge uh, difficulty in managing the, the supply chain. Uh, actually, the, your question, uh, what we are doing uh, in Korea, is probably the question for rest of us, other than the US or EU or China. Uh, we have a huge dependence on trade, and what can we do? Actually, uh, what we try to do is to diversify and make a more flexible supply chain and industry ecosystem. So we try to reach out uh, uh, as many trading partner as possible. So uh, of course we try to strengthen our strategic alliance with traditional trading partner like US or EU or other country. But we now try to reach out uh, the, uh, the other uh, areas so like even Africa or uh, the Latin America or uh, Central Asia. So. Uh, instead of using uh, the, the conventional tool of like a free trade agreement, uh, that seems to emphasize like a market opening and the selling more product to uh, the other country, we try to emphasize economic partnership. So we try to use now economic partnership agreement and using that technology, we try to reach out uh, <coughs> as, as wide as possible uh, to prepare more flexible and diversified uh, supply chain uh, for our country. Probably that is uh, the, the mission for many country in the world of trading system uh, nowadays. Okay, um, so David, um, could you talk a bit about what you think the issues are? And if you were being asked by the USTR, which I presume you are constantly, or perhaps not, um, and you had the objective of changing the emphasis in world trade policy, mm -hmm. what would you like her and her government to be doing? So as, as uh, the, the private sector representative on this panel, Absolutely. Uh, and I, I can't presume to speak for the private sector, but I, I will, I'll share our thoughts as a global multinational. We've heard from our first two panelists in terms of changes in, in the trade environment, changes in globalization. And what that clearly feels like for the private sector is greater fragmentation. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion about this, uh, and it, it's, it's a common narrative now, uh, but greater fragmentation in terms of capital flows, greater fragmentation in terms of, of supply chain risks around these issues. I'd also like to touch on a, another topic that doesn't get quite as much attention as those two, which is digital trade. Uh, and digital trade has been a, a huge growth area uh, over the number of years where it's, it's an area where we've seen the benefits of uh, technology and driving innovation. And that has, has led to opportunity and prosperity in, in a number of areas driven by that trade. Uh, Martin, you said we had to talk about some of the problems associated with, with digital trade. And I, I will touch on that right now, which is we are seeing that kind of fragmentation play out in digital trade as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in data flows. And it doesn't get as much attention, in, perhaps because it is, it is not a, a tangible good. It doesn't get as much attention as you might see in uh, supply chain issues 
uh, or fragmentation of, of other areas of, of more tangible goods. Uh, and so just to give an example on this, we are seeing data localization requirements in countries all over the world. Uh, and this is, this is playing out, I would say, very publicly in, for example, areas around uh, data localization requirements in countries like China. Uh, but we're also seeing data localization requirements in many, many other countries around the world. This is not um, limited to one or two countries in the world. Uh, and this can have a, a significant impact in a number of areas. Uh, for example, a, a small business looking to, uh, a small fintech looking to take advantage of accessing the cloud and the capabilities that that would bring in terms of access to uh, large amounts of data, analytics in a cloud, uh, that could be limited by data localization requirements. So we, we see this as a, a significant area of concern. We think uh, it's important that it gets more of a, a focus and a spotlight. Uh, if you, uh, you look at some OECD data, uh, there is a potential for digital trade to be larger than tangible trade uh, or trade in goods by 2025. Uh, but when we see these data localization uh, issues or other restrictions on digital trade, that can have a meaningful impact in terms of limiting or restraining growth. So a big area of, of focus, uh, I would say, for us and certainly for a number of other uh, members of the private sector. Okay. Then, Veronica, if I may, um, I would imagine that what you heard from um, Ambassador Tai um, was music to your ears. It was. You've been waiting <laughs> for somebody to talk, say things like that from a powerful country for, well, I don't know, not you personally, but people in your organization probably for about 40 years. Uh, and so this is music to your ears, I imagine. But let's get to the concrete, because that would help in our subsequent discussion. When you hear what she says, what do you think it should mean? And is there enough being talked about by her and other powerful people, the EU and so forth, which actually answers your concerns in this area? Well, I totally agree. We are very, very happy to hear, to have a trade policy which is worker-centered. But what does it mean in practice? That's, of course, a challenge. And I also listened to um, the Sp Spanish Prime Minister yesterday when he talked about trade, and he said that we need to rethink trade policy. Again, we agree, but what does it mean in practice? I think the changes we have been advocated for and some of the changes we have seen, some of the improvements are, I'm afraid, cosmetic changes. I mean, we've been calling for labor clauses in trade agreements for a very long time. We do have labor clauses, but they haven't really delivered. Um, they are very difficult to implement, so they haven't really had a big impact uh, on, on workers. Um, we have also called for binding legislation on uh, due diligence, for example. Countries have taken measures in these areas as well. I think France was probably the first country that adopted uh, legislation in this area. Germany just did. They have a new piece of legislation that entered into force uh, the 1st of January this year. Um, <coughs> so there are things being done, but I think what is really key for unions is about collective bargaining and social dialogue. Uh, there are studies that show that trade has a negative impact on working conditions and wage. I was just looking at a study before coming here, which was published last year from a French institute, and they had calculated um, a decrease in wages of 10%, uh, hourly wages, um, and, but that was for, for, for Eastern Europe. I mean, I know we don't have time to go into details, but there are such studies, but there are also other studies that show that when you have higher collective bargaining rates, you can also um, better, um, the workers can benefit from the gains from trade. So that, therefore, collective bargaining and social dialogue is so important. And as you know, the trade union membership has decreased for, for a number of years. We see that the um, collective bargaining coverage has been eroded as well. So I think that if we want to make trade more worker friendly, we also need to focus much more on social dialogue and collective bargaining. And we have, th through many, many years, 40 years maybe, as you mentioned, we have seen how uh, many governments have taken deliberate measures to dismantle um, industrial relations, uh, collective bargaining institutions, and we need to rebuild those. I think if we have strong um, 
uh, strong social partners that can negotiate working conditions, uh, we can also much more benefit from trade because, of course, we do need trade. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But it's all about how the competition is, is being made. We don't want to see competition on the basis of exploiting workers. I mean, the basic things like there shouldn't be any competition uh, or there shouldn't be any um, products and services being produced by slave labor, child labor, or by uh, violating workers' rights, for example. That's so basic, yet it's so difficult to implement. Okay, that, I think we've had a wonderful, given the limited time, sort of introduction to major issues. Um, so what we'll now do is let's discuss some of these, and we will hope the opportunity with these one or two questions at the end. So if you want a question, remember to think about it. Um, I know the difference between a question and a statement. The question ends with a question mark, and all good questions can be answered in, asked in one sentence, I promise you, because <laughs> that's what I do for a living. So please think of that when you imagine your question. So let's start with you, um, Ambassador. Um, I'm interested in your reactions to what's been said in, in different ways. Um, the last um, speaker, Veronica, said these are com cosmetic changes. Show us that they're real. And um, what are you doing that makes them real? And what are the implications of that? Um, um, Minister Ahn brought out, I think, a very important issue, and he did it in different ways. But basically, there are the superpowers. Of the three, big three, and then there are lots and lots of small, smaller open economies, tremendously open to trade, and worried what's going on. Um, and there's there's the real shock element of it, and there's a trade policy shock element. And so, how do you make people like the Koreans and your other friends and other trading partners that depend on Vietnam and many others actually feel that? What you want to do domestically is also going to not destroy them. You know, how do you relate your domestic priorities, workers are all very clear, with the, the, the aspirations of countries to grow through trade? And then, of course, David was talking about digital trade and the role of digital trade, and more broadly about the concern that What's going on is a fragmentation process, and we, nobody knows where it ends. And that creates radical uncertainty for business. And that's also important. So you can't discuss every aspect of this, but these, each person has raised a pretty quite important question. So how would you address those very clear concerns? So um, let me take a couple of the prompts. And I of course. I, I, I do feel like I'm being graded. In fact, it's clear everybody here is being graded. So I'll try to uh, stay within the time. You're not being graded at all, I promise you. <laughs> Just don't uh, ask me to write, uh, anyway, write an essay all, at the end. You're all alpha, I <laughs> promise. <laughs> but the, but the uh, yes. no, no, I just want you, this is a, these are very, uh, these are really important issues, as you know better than I do. So um, let me uh, share with all of you um, uh, a set of experiences that I've had. Um, so sometimes I find myself in forums like this one, um, surrounded by very influential, extremely thoughtful people. And um, I never uh, lose an opportunity. I never want to lose an opportunity to have this engagement. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, two highlights in my career so far as US trade representative, which I think um, distinguished me from all of my predecessors, is that I was early on in June of 2021 invited by uh, then uh, president uh, of the AFL-CIO, Rich Trumka, uh, whom we lost um, in August of 21, uh, to give a speech on uh, worker-centered trade at the headquarters of the AFL-CIO. Mm -hmm. um, a tremendous honor. <clears throat> Uh, because it demonstrated a trust and a partnership from um, uh, one of our leading labor organizations uh, to craft a trade policy together. Uh, last August, I was invited by uh, the president of the United Steel Workers to address um, steel workers at their uh, annual convention in Las Vegas. 
uh, it was two or three thousand uh, members of the union. I've never spoken to uh, in person uh, a, 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 an event in a group that large. Um, and um, uh, there's a different energy in the room than here at, uh, at the WEF, uh, but um, also an incredibly important audience for our vision for trade. Um, on the innovations uh, that we are trying to make uh, substantively on trade, let me take an opportunity to address what we are doing. Uh, the USMCA remains a bedrock foundational touchstone for us. Uh, on um, uh, concretely what worker-centered trade means. Uh, if you look at that agreement, <clears throat> let me point out the pieces of it that were critical to um, uh, garnering robust support from uh, the Democrats in the House and the Senate, the support of the AFL-CIO and many of its affiliates, which is um, very high standard uh, labor commitments, enforceable, not just through a state-to-state -state dispute settlement mechanism, but also a um, facility-specific, um, labor-specific mechanism that allows the United States and Mexico to partner to reinforce the implementation of Mexico's labor justice reforms. And that mechanism, which we call the rapid response mechanism, has been triggered uh, five or six times so far in each instance, we have either uh, on our own or through a partner uh, learned of uh, the likely <coughs> denial of rights to collective bargaining or the Freeman of Association at a sp specific facility in Mexico. And it has allowed us to intervene to trigger the mechanism, working again with the Mexican government. In each of those cases, uh, that mechanism has assisted the workers at that facility in electing an independent union, in um, uh, adopting uh, a collective bargaining agreement that reflects their views, and in securing uh, higher wages and better benefits. So real changes on the ground, on the theory that <clears throat> uh, empowering the workers in Mexico makes Mexico uh, a more um, secure place for investment. Mm -hmm. From a North American competitiveness standpoint, um, uh, helps to ensure that the standards and rights that American workers have, Canadian workers have, uh, cannot be eroded through uh, um, uh, exploitation in Mexico, given uh, that we have for 30 years now been in um, a uh, free trade and economic zone together. Um, so uh, that's one instance. Another instance is on forced labor. Uh, I believe at this point the United States and Canada are the only countries in the world that have a, a complete ban on imports that are produced in whole or in part using forced labor. We are, uh, it is clear in the international forums in our conversations that uh, no one stands for slave labor. And everyone knows that the right answer is global supply chains should not be built on the exploitation of human beings in that very, very gross form. However, <clears throat> how do you implement this? Uh, for us, uh, it is a complete ban, and there are challenges in terms of implementing and enforcing at the border. We are delighted to be working with partner countries who share our vision, but who have different systems who are coming at this through a due diligence perspective, uh, which is um, um, uh, the requirements to know what your supply chain looks like, uh, how your goods are being produced, <clears throat> and whether or not forced labor is being employed at any stage, uh, and to assess where that liability should be, again, um, to work together uh, to ensure that globalization is not built on the backs of uh, unwilling uh, and uh, vulnerable people. So those are a couple examples in terms of the heft that we bring to our worker-centered trade vision. And I can tell you every counterpart that I have, including Minister Ahn, uh, and uh, will uh, engage with us on uh, how to advance uh, this particular vision. Because at the end of the day, I think that this new version of globalization we're working towards um, especially coming out of these years of disruption because of war, geopolitical tensions, uh, supply chain disruptions, uh, natural disasters, knowing that there is an increasing climate crisis that's going to impact markets and livelihoods, uh, that we need 
a global trading system, we need policies that are going to promote resilience, sustainability, not just for the planet, but also for our people, and inclusiveness. And uh, it, is, um, it is hard because this requires change, but the world is changing anyway. There is an opportunity for us to get ahead with a vision for positive change and to work together with our friends and our partners because every one of my colleagues who is an economic policymaker, a trade policy leader, is trying to do exactly the same thing, which is to serve the interests of the people in their economy. Let me ask, if I may, Veronica, I'll come back to you because um, Ambassador Tai has clearly addressed your concerns. In the, so I'd be interested in two questions. I just want to, one of which is quite a big one, and it's but pretty fundamental. So first of all, I'd be very interested in your reaction to what the ambassador has just said, and how far you think the concerns she's put forward as implemented in the US, MCTA, isn't it? MCA. MTA. So they dropped. They dropped the T. They dropped the T. They dropped the trade. It's MCA. MCA. Yeah, sorry, yes. I thought so. I, I'll come to this in a moment. Um, I think it's very interesting that it was, that was very interesting, it was negotiated under the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, with congressional involvement. Um, because the, the point is there's a sort of bipartisan aspect of this, which is very, very important to understand. But anyway, first question, how do you react? Mm -hmm. Does this go in the direction of you want? How much more would you want? Yeah. And the second question I just want to be really clear on. You said, you made a great, understandably, and it fits in with what Ambassador Tai said about the AFL-CIO and the steelworkers. I knew Mr. Trump, by the way. Uh, I met him on a couple of occasions. So take the logic of your position. Do you think that if that Western countries or countries that recognize the rights of labor to organize collectively should cease to trade with China? Finish. <laughs> Just cease. No, that's a logical implication. So those are my two questions. Mm. Well, the first one is easy. Um, well, the, the second one wasn't meant to be easy, <laughs> but it's the logical implication. Yeah. Well, on the first one, when I made my introductory remarks, I was referring particularly to Europe, because I'm European, I'm of Swedish, course. as you mentioned. Of course. Of course. Uh, and but I, European trade involves yeah. the world. No, no, it does. But my experience are mainly with European free trade agreements. And there I see um, lots of things that need to be done. So we, we, I, I'm, we are very positive about the changes that have taken place in the US. And I think that they could be a model for Europe as well. Um, so it's definitely something that uh, I believe uh, you, you're not well. European countries, EU, and so on, should uh, look into this more. What can be done? Because the, the the clauses we have today in the European Free Trade Agreements, in my view, they don't work. Um, that doesn't mean that we will stop here. Because also one of the points I made before was the the need to to. Um, to support freedom of association collective bargaining, and that was also mentioned by, by the trade representative. Uh, and here, governments could do much more. And I was also delighted to hear the German labor minister in the panel, uh, the session just before, also talking about the importance of uh, collective bargaining and supporting that the governments have a job to do. It's not just to leave it to social partners, but also to, to support social partners in doing this job. Um, now, the second question is, hmm, now you're really putting me on the spot. Uh, I'm not sure what to say. Um, I might have a personal view, and then we have uh, <laughs> official views of the trade union organizations as well. Um, as I said before, uh, we should not accept trade uh, in goods and services, which is uh, made uh, on the exploitation of workers. So, in these cases, uh, there shouldn't be any trade. Um, that doesn't mean that everything which is produced in China has been done through slave labor, for example. Uh, but there are such cases. But so how do you single out then those cases not... from others? That, that's a tricky question. Okay, okay, I agree completely. Of course, the slave labor question in the Chinese context is very specific. Well, it has been very specific. We know what that is. Uh, but more broadly, I mean, there isn't free collective bargaining in China. It's a matter of principle. So that raises a pretty big issue, doesn't it? It does. Okay. So we'll move on <laughs> to note that uh, and, and uh, come back to this. Um, 
Minister Ahn, you raised an absolutely central issue, which is supply chain um, vulnerability, uh, um, uh, and you've been very much involved. You're a very important part of the global supply chains on both sides. I mean, really important part. And you supply a lot of stuff, which is very important. So when you look at this as a policy question, not as a what business should do question, because business will do whatever it does, um, as a policy issue from the Korean point of view, what do you want to see done to make to deal with the supply chain issue? Um, do you want governments to s decide this country should be in the supply chain because it's reliable and friendly and this shouldn't be? Um, what do you think the right policy response from your perspective is to this quite understandable concern about the reliability of supply chains? So as, as I uh, mentioned, <coughs> basically what we try to do is to provide more flexible and more diversified options for the business community. Of course. So we try to reach out uh, other countries and try to have uh, the new kind of the trade relationship. Previously, uh, it was a question of whether we have FTA or not. Okay. But to have FT, it takes a whole lot of political capital of because it takes a lot of market access uh, negotiations. But uh, we now try to have like a trade investment partnership framework, for example. Without talking about the, the tariff uh, reduction or negotiation, we try to emphasize like uh, development cooperations or digital cooperations, green uh, technology uh, cooperation, or even bio. Uh, economy uh, partnership. So we try to reach out many country and we try to basically provide the, the business community more flexible and more options to take. So in case we have some, uh, some issue uh, with the supply chain disruption, uh, with whatever reason, uh, even climate change issue or some military uh, aggression, whatever, then we try to basically provide another option with uh, some new uh, trade partners. That is basically, uh, we try to do as a policy. So it's almost linked in with development policy. I mean, the, 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 uh, you're trying to find relationships within an institutional context which integrates your business with, what, with other economies that are of right, some importance. Right, right, okay. right. That makes sort of sense. So, David, the last word before we go to the audience. Um, so you started raising the concern about fragmentation. Do you feel better about it now than you did um, half an hour ago or even more anxious? I would say I'm, I'm not convinced that we have found the resolution. <laughs> so. Well, I think that's, that's uh, uh, fair. So let's just follow up that with, with one so let's suppose you were having a conversation with um, ministers uh, here, and we they don't need to answer now because we probably won't have the time, alas. Um, so how, what do you think they really should bear in mind if they're going to m meet their objectives, which are their objectives, legitimate, democratically elected governments, while minimizing the fragmentation problem? What should be in the, from <coughs> representing business in broad sense, but accepting their objectives? What should they be trying to do, or perhaps more important, avoid? So, if, if we maintain the focus on digital trade for the purpose of this for, question, for, yes, why not? And I think uh, there is an opportunity. First of all, countries, governments have a legitimate interest in national security issues around of their course, data. Of course. Uh, around, they have legitimate interest for their citizens in terms of privacy. Uh, if you look at the Venn diagram, though, I mean, the, there's plenty of other um, room for uh, very reasonable, very practical agreement around how uh, there can be digital trade and movement of data across borders that does not raise concerns around national security issues, does not raise concerns around privacy issues. And I think that very broad area is, is the opportunity set. 
we would like to see, and, and a number of, of companies in the private sector uh, are involved in pushing for this, we would like to see uh, a forum, whether it is the G7 or another forum, come together and, and take a, uh, a coordinated co policy approach on this. Uh, the G20 could be another, but there's some challenges with the G20's uh, finding agreement among its, its uh, members at this point. But finding uh, a sense of cooperation and a consistent approach across that forum that can then uh, attract other members, uh, other governments to, uh, to aligning around this. And then another area where I think there's a real opportunity, and the minister touched on this to a certain extent, uh, there are some great examples of uh, free trade agreements that address uh, digital trade. Uh, and just to, to pick out a couple, uh, the UK and Singapore have an excellent one. The US and Japan have an excellent one. Uh, and so there, there are opportunities like that. It is a little bit less efficient to do that on a bilateral basis on, on, the, global, uh, on the global stage. Uh, so we would like to see that kind of cooperation between uh, business and governments in, in the context of some kind of G7 type forum, uh, as well as more of the bilateral agreements. So one implication of what you're saying is that in the end it would really be quite helpful if there was a degree of multilateral agreement and that if even the USMCA is an example even though it's quite a small group. So I'm going to take a couple of questions, be very, very quick, explain who you are. Um, okay, you here. Yeah, say who you are and one sentence question. Yes. So uh, I am Jan uh, from PPF Group, conglomerate from Czech Republic but having 50,000 employees in Asia. So basically the, uh, the discussion, especially from the ladies, is important for us. And the question is when we are thinking about labor laws and slavery, et cetera, how to report it in a, some globally standardized manner. So basically everybody will see whether you are doing good job or not. And with the rise of ESG, wouldn't it be possible to a little bit move, not move, but not only do E as an environment, but with the rise of social taxonomy, European Union CSRD regulation, so whether to use ESG as a standardized form, how to report about all these things. This is made okay. for Mrs. Nielsen and for Mrs. Tyler. Okay, well, then, uh, and the lady over here, please. Yes. Uh, uh, you've probably got a microphone coming to you. If you just say who you are <coughs> and ask the question. Julia Horowitz with CNN. Um, there's been a lot of conversation at Davos this year about nearshoring and friendshoring. I understand some of the political arguments for moving forward with those types of arrangements, but I'm wondering um, if there are thoughts on any negative economic consequences, such as for inflation. Uh, such as? For inflation. Okay. Um, so let's start with, and I'll start with you, Veronica, if I may, on the first question. Mm -hmm. um, how do you improve, clarify, and standardized reporting in the area you're concerned with. Yeah. What would that mean in practice yeah. for business and presumably policy agreement? Yeah. That's a very difficult question because many of these social audits, they don't really have the competence to look into, for example, violations of labor rights because they don't have enough knowledge about these issues. And this is something that trade unions have highlighted many times. And that's why I would go back to, again then to worker representation. If where workers are free to organize, uh, you, it's much easier to detect these kind of problems because they would then come up. But when you have workers which are not allowed to form trade unions, um, how then can you fix this problem? So it's, it's really back to organizing of workers, letting workers organize and you will have that information much more readily available. I've seen so many audits where um, for example, workers are not free to reply to the questions. They cannot really tell what the conditions are like in the factory because they will have the manager just watching behind. Uh, and in that case, you will not have um, the, the, the full picture of what is happening in a factory. So it's extremely important. Um, and I have doubts about the, these different reporting mechanisms, I have to say. Um, and, and I think that the best answer is really to make sure involve trade unions in this work and that's also what global union federations why they have these uh, framework agreements uh, because they can also help looking at the situation on the ground they have trade unions all over the world um, and I think that's a, a more reliable source of information to know what is actually happening on the ground I'm afraid we're 
we've got one minute left, and I'm going to give Ambassador the last word because the question was addressed to you. If you I hope you don't mind. I'm very sorry, but uh, this is always going to be very difficult. So nearshoring and friendshoring, um, what are the economic implications of that? Um, I have got a minute. I suppose part of the question is, um, what does this mean to you? Sure. So um, I think that whether it's in uh, the world of goods trade or services trade or digital trade, part of what we are struggling with right now at this inflection point is uh, trust. Whether or not you trust your partners, whether or not you trust your actors in terms of what they're going to do with the data, whether you trust each other, whether you trust that uh, we are making the kinds of uh, gains with respect to the climate crisis that will allow for a sustainable future for all of us. Um, in that context, <clears throat> we are struggling against um, this uh, paradigm of efficiency. And I think this gets to your point on fragmentation also. From the business side, I can completely understand an anxiety around we're looking at a less efficient world. And the world that we have been through has been really about maximizing efficiency. But I think that is part of the point, which is this. Um, you know what's really inefficient is um, health insurance. I got to pay um, $50 every two weeks, even though I'm healthy. But the logic is that when I do have that crisis, when I inevitably need more and run into a health issue, I have paid into a system that will take care of me, right? And so I think that the way we need to think about it is a less efficient uh, world economic system will necessarily mean that we can't just be pursuing the lowest cost, the maximum cost efficiency, but that premium that is going to come with that um, um, uh, extra work that we have to do uh, is really an insurance policy to make sure that we run into problems, whether it's an earthquake, whether it's a tornado, whether it's another epidemic that turns into a pandemic, whether it is non-economically based decision making that erupts in uh, military uh, incursion, uh, that uh, we're not all there to suffer for it, but that we've thought ahead and that we have systems that can help us bounce back. I'm going to have to close this. I think we could have had another three or four hours, but uh, I think the conclusion that I would reach is um, it's very obvious. The world we're moving into is different from the, in its assumptions from what they might have been 10 years ago, certainly 15 years ago. But I think it's also clear that there is immense uncertainty about how that's going to evolve. Um, within countries and certainly among them because one reality remains about trade is by definition it involves at least two sovereigns and it could involve lots more and sovereigns have different views of things and no sovereign can always get its own way so that creates a complex world which is why we have international agreements and we will continue to need them what they're going to look like and how they will work, that is one of the mysteries we're going to unfold over the next few years. Um, and uh, with that, I would thank the panelists. I think it's been a very good discussion. We've raised lots and lots of important questions, and I look forward to further discussions on these issues. And thank you for listening. Thank you.